thank you so much to join with you today and that we can really um, come together and have discussion and debate on this topic of putting people before protocols. What on earth might I be meaning by that? Now, over 85 years ago, Ardla identified how the use of classification and narrow typologies around mental health disregarded the relationship of the individual to the problems of the outside world. This is what Ardla said. And in this talk, I aim to draw on Ardler's wisdom and explore some of the history around these classifications and treatment protocols. I'll be looking at how their use could mean a loss of understanding of a person's unique attitude to life and could crucially lose sight of their experience of community and cultural belonging. And I'll also be introducing more recently developed alternatives that resonate with Ardler's positive, holistic and relational approach. Now, I will be inviting you intermittently, just occasionally, to reflect on your own around the aspects um, that I'll be sharing. And maybe we'll see how the time goes, and maybe time for a breakout room. I know Sabina has got everything under, under control here, and I'm very grateful to you, Sabina, for that. Um, but I hope, you know, we will have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So maybe when I'm inviting you to do some reflections, we can sort of hold those in mind and bring them into discussion, should you wish. Okay, let's just look and meet Jaden. Now, Jaden's 14, and he's the only child of a single parent, white British mother, and he's not ever met his father who returned to Jamaica. And he lived first in a high rise flat in a deprived area of a city with racism of unemployment high. Jaden was fostered at six after being removed from his drug using mother. Now, his aggressive behavior resulted in him continually moving between temporary foster homes and being excluded from mainstream school. He's been charged with drug dealing and participation in a violent gang. Now, those around Jaden describe him as aggressive, vindictive, isolated. Then, following psychological assessment, he's been given various diagnoses, including those of conduct disorder, reactive attachment disorder, attention deficit disorder, and substance abuse disorder. Okay, that's all very fine. But what do these diagnostic labels actually tell us about Jaden and how best to support him in future? How do they help us appreciate Jaden's conclusions that he has drawn from these experiences and his unique movement in life? Do these Diagnoses help us understand the way he is working to overcome his feeling of vulnerability and his attempts to belong. How do they address his unique perception of his culture and deep embedded adverse community experiences? And crucially, do they note his resources, his kindness to stray dogs, his skills with mending bikes, his artistic ability in graffiti design? and his determination not to be beaten down. Now, drawing on Ardler's wisdom and some more recent developments, I'm aiming to challenge the notion that biomedically based models of diagnosis, classification and fixed protocols, I want to challenge them that are not offering an appropriate frame for understanding the whole person. Let's just look and keep, keep um, Jaden's story in mind and review some core aspects of Ardler's individual psychology. Now, as I mentioned at the start, Ardler stated the raw material with which the individual psychologist works is the relationship of the person to the problems of the outside world. And whilst it may not seem so on first sight for those new to Adlerian psychology, this raw material of our relationship to the problems of the outside world offers an optimistic base for change. Adler identified there is an innate potential for our sense of social connectedness, with each of us having the capacity to live in harmony with society, that is, his core tenet, social interest, or Gemeinschaftsgefühl. 
Now, where there is deep discouragement, such as in Jaden's case, this does not need to be, this does, this does need to be consciously developed. However, this possibility and hope for the future is always there even in the most challenging of situations. And the development of social interest offering a measure of mental health. And Adler stated, all my efforts are devoted towards increasing the social interest of the patient. As soon as he, and we can say she and they, are, can connect himself with his fellow men on an equal and cooperating footing, he is cured. So I'll, I'll stay with Arda's notion of that he as a gender one, but please know I want to encapsulate all, um, all uh, uh, pronouns there. And in addition, there is his holism. Every biological, psychological and social aspect of the individual is dynamically and systematically connected, said Arda. What an extraordinary person he was, so ahead of his time. Now, Arda, you use the term psychology of use to describe his functional or dynamic psychology, which adheres to the principle of soft determinism. So it is not what we possess, but what we do with it that is central to understanding ourselves. The creativity of individuals offers an optimistic perspective for our potential to move forward with hope in the face of adversity. Now, with the Olympics and sport in mind, I was just exploring this um, really only in the last week or two, but here's one extraordinary example. As many of you will know, that Yemen has been devastated by conflict, been devastated by the corona pandemic and a humanitarian crisis that the United Nations has called the world's worst. This young woman, was just one of the many injured, resulting tragically in, a, in an amputation. But, oh, I've said this young woman here. Yes, there she is. But that didn't stop her getting together with others with support from community connection. There's that Adlerian core aspect with others to create. What did she create? A woman's wheelchair basketball team and ultimately to be involved in championship games. So let's keep this social relatedness of the, of the human at the forefront of awareness. And I'll be focusing on Adler's emphasis on unity, holism, and self-creativity, and particularly on his radical understanding of how the use of classification into narrow typologies around mental health can mean a loss of understanding of the person's unique attitude to life, their culture, their ex and their experience of the social community. Now, in the West, oh, I'll just move on. In the West, the, with a medical diagnostic model, we are seen to possess a condition, e.g. she has cancer. And this has also become the main way of addressing mental health problems. For example, we've already seen this. Jaden has reactive attachment disorder. And this is often without acknowledging the relationship of the person to the outside world. Now, as I said earlier, 85 years ago, this is in a paper in 1935, and I was so grateful to John Sperry for introducing me to this paper, was voicing a major concern around such a classification of mental health issues through diagnostic labels. When he said, and you can see on the slide, I believe it is because of the parsimony of language that many scientists have come to mistaken conclusions, believing in high percentages, real qualities, et cetera. To present the individual understandably in words requires an extensive reviewing of all his or uh, their facets. Yet too often psychologists are tempted away from this recognition and take the easier but unfruitful roads of classification. Now, here's just, just a moment of vivid reflection now. Um, just reflect for those of you who are in practice and 
um, uh, uh, maybe one or two of your clients, or you may reflect on a more personal situation, perhaps where a single label diagnosis has been given. And just keep this in mind as we progress through my talk, and we can maybe come back to that, just so you can have that uh, person, that situation in mind. I'll just leave you for, for half a minute just to, to kind of reflect, maybe jot it down on a bit of paper. Um, to, to okay. We'll just give a moment, okay. Let's just learn more about this classification system. One truly shocking example of classification and labeling is that right up till 1959 in the UK, mothers of illegitimate children were, amongst others, labeled moral imbeciles. How extraordinary is that? And that they were labeled moral imbeciles, especially in cases of repeated births out of wedlock and thus placed in an institution for defectives or to be placed under guardianship. Now, physicians had a very clear explanation and very clear sort of protocols of treatment to moral imbeciles, physicians explained, were those born without a moral sense. And in Victorian times, they were perceived to possess the following fixed traits. Though often cunning and intelligent, this is a quote, they lack the ability to determine right from wrong. They demonstrate moral defect from their earliest years, practicing cruelties without remorse, and often indulge in sexual behavior that experts predicted would only unleash great numbers of upon society. I hope you're feeling shocked as well as terrifying. Um, list here. But it comes closer to my own experience because I recall as a young student volunteer in the late 1960s, I was working in what was then termed the local mental hospital. So this is 1968 and feeling shocked when talking with some women aged 60 and 70 who'd been diagnosed as moral imbeciles many years before. Now, it wasn't they were considered now, but they were now totally institutionalized and a frightening form of learned helplessness with, understandably, major mental health issues further developed by the hideous earlier diagnosis and so-called treatment. Uh, I'll never forget talking to one woman in her 70s who shared her pain of having had her baby taken from her and then being incarcerated in hospital. I can see some people are waiting to be admitted, but I think um, maybe you're admitting them, Sabrina. Thanks very much. Okay, so it doesn't stop there, unfortunately, because we can see how the experiences of trauma, abuse, discrimination, and deprivation can be sealed off behind the label. Now, a particularly terrifying example of this in the mid 19th century can be seen in the term drapetomania. Drapetomania was a conjectural mental illness created, created in 81 by Southern American physician Samuel Cartwright, who perceived that a slave fleeing captivity, he perceived this as madness and in quote, an uncontrollable or insane impulsion to wander. That's the definition of drapetomania, an uncontrolled or insane impulse, compulsion, an impulsion to wander. Now, I guess all of us here would view this as actually a deeply courageous and sane response. So this diagnosis remained in Stedman's practical medical direction until as late as 1914. Uh, I mean, this is just truly a hideous example of racism disguised as science. But I believe we can't rest on our laurels today, but we need continually to be addressing our own implicit biases. I know that of myself, absolutely. Now, 
Adler's influence in the UK challenging this form of classification can be traced back to his first visit to the UK in 1923, when he gave a lecture on individual psychology at the Seventh International Congress of Psychology. Now, this was heard by Dr. Neil Beatty. Dr. Neil Beatty is the father of our UK Adlerian Society's present president, Dr. Lillian Beatty. And Lillian Beatty, also a medical doctor and renowned Adlerian, described to me how her father, a medical officer, said within three minutes of hearing Arda speak, I knew I was in the presence of a genius. So that's what her father told her. And Adler's influence in social and preventive meds, uh, medicine at this time can be found in Beatty's important historical paper, Social Medicine and the New Psychology. This was written in the UK in 1933. And here Beatty states, as medical men and women, we have been subjected to an education and training, which has been almost entirely mechanistic in character. The absence of any philosophical teaching has caused us to forget that in every man, let's say woman, person, is a body, a mind, and a spirit. Thus, merely to treat the physical basis of any patient is a mistake, a mistake which is responsible for many failures in the consulting room and at the bedside. Now, despite the writings and practice of those such as Beatty and the implementation in the UK of a National Health Service in 1948, the mentally distressed were still classified as a class apart and increasing numbers ending up in the old fashioned mental institutions with minimal social and psychological support, as were the women I described earlier. Let's look further um, at this challenge. Now, many of you will know of Phyllis Bottom, and um, Bottom Adler's, was Adler's first biographer and, and friend, and she writes of her experience of psychiatrist's response to Adler's ideas in the 1930s. And I think these still have resonance today. She says, neither the English nor the American psychiatrists were prepared to submit themselves to the retraining necessary. They were honestly unaware how convenient to themselves and to their livelihood, the more complicated forms of psychiatry were. Naturally, the more complicated the psychiatry, the more financially advantageous the treatment, says Bottom Riley. Now, Bottom also offers a significant statement from a superintendent of a large mental hospital in the UK who gave the following reason for not using Adlerian therapy in his hospital. He says, I'm convinced of the truth of Adler's theories. Hmm but I wasn't brought up on them. And I've no time to change the system that I was trained in for a better one. Now, I think this quote from the 1930s could equally relate to some attitudes prevalent today. Let's just look at this cartoon here. Yeah. Okay. Speaks. Um, doesn't need any explanation. Now, how far have we actually traveled in the last 85 years in taking on board Adler's wisdom regarding a holistic approach that crucially notes our social embeddedness? And how much is Western psychiatry still being tempted by what Adler called the easier but unfruitful roads of classification? We see that the biomedical model still dominates Western psychiatry with publications that classify mental health issues, such as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders and the International Statistical Classification of Diseases. And these also becoming a strong influence in other areas of the world. I think the increasingly dominant biomedical paradigm can be seen clearly in the 1983rd edition of DSM, DSM-3, and subsequently with similar changes in the ICD. Interestingly, while DSM-4, the fourth edition, referred to disorders as biopsychosocial, the latest fifth edition of DSM in, in 2013 and the present, present um, 
manual dropped the social component and now defines mental disorders as psychobiological in nature. Now, Adlerians, Bill and Monica Nickel in the 2018 paper identify how deeply the diagnostic models are based within Western culture and Western ideas regarding the functioning of the brain and the biological base of behavior. And they note that diagnostic categories such as attention deficit disorder, anorexia, obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder, and then treatment methods such as medications, behavioral based symptom control strategies, they really they, they're stating that these effectively return us to the original 19th century ideas of classification of mental disorders. They certainly seem a little different in tone, perhaps, from terms in the 1930s, mental health classifications such as neurotic heredity, including hysteria, or as I mentioned, moral imbeciles. Let's also have a look at Big Father, at pharmaceutical connections here. You may also recall I mentioned how Phyllis Botteau noted in the 1930s that naturally the more complicated the psychiatry, the more financially advantageous the treatment. Now, an example of this financially advantageous link today might be seen in the development of DSM-5 and its connections and potential conflicts of interest between the pharmaceutical industry and the DSM-5 task force. That's the group that revised the manual. It's been recorded that 21 out of 29 of the DSM task force have received honoraria, consultancy fees or funding from the pharmaceutical industry. And by promoting the notion of universal brain-based disease and disorder categories, it's widespread marketing of drugs purporting to control the symptoms is effectively enabled and in turn become expected by patients and clients, whether they're effective or not. And Bill, Bill and Monica Nickel note how this psychobiological paradigm ignores the multitude of social factors and how many of the children and adolescents with whom they come into contact are given diagnoses based on presenting symptoms. And in turn, treatment plans that focus primarily on prescribing psychopharmacological medications and treatment based on symptom control. Now, James Davis, a researcher psychologist, interviewed many key members of the committees involved in the developing of DSM volumes. And these do reveal some rather extraordinary stories, very openly shared, which is interesting, of actually very minimal research backup and an often cheerful but arbitrary nature of how decisions were made regarding diagnostic categories. And Dr. Alan Francis, the chair of DSM-4, told Davis that the DSM-5 is proposing changes that will dramatically expand the realm of psychiatry and narrow the realm of normality. He goes on to say, I'm particularly concerned that this will lead to the excessive use of medication. And in addition, in an article that Dr. Francis wrote, No Child Left Undiagnosed, he noted that by using the DSM-5 criteria, 81% of youth in our Western world now qualify for at least one psychiatric diagnosis. The abnormal now becomes statistically the normal. Now, before looking further at Adlerian models, um, uh, Let's uh, of psychopathology, a very recent major move away from the medical model can be seen in the recent work of a team of UK clinical psychologists and service users who've created the power threat meaning framework. And I will be looking at this in a little more detail um, later as it resonates very strongly with Adler's way of conceptualizing mental distress. They've critiqued the use of the medical model for mental distress and a lack of evidence of any biomarkers using perhaps these, these thought provoking um, uh, images. So, what's happening here? Why can't I move on? Sorry, I'm just going to. Oh, there we go. It hasn't moved on now. That's fine. So, here we are. Here's what they describe as a legitimate medical model. So, we've got why does Azim have headaches? Well, because he has a, a brain tumor, unfortunately. How, how do you know he has a brain tumor? Well, 
because it showed up on a scan. So here we have a very clear link, a biomarker we can see. Let's look at a different argument, a diagnosis circular argument. Oh, why is Lara so emotionally unstable? Hmm, because she has borderline personality disorder. How do you know she's got borderline personality disorder? Well, because she's so emotionally unstable. Okay. Now, there's no doubt that some find a diagnosis or label affirming in terms of their pain and discouragement. Um, and there are also, I appreciate many contexts where there, the challenge of needing a label of is, is, is clearly there. Otherwise, not going to get insurance cover, not going to get follow-up treatment or support. Certainly, one example, I found clients who have had a diagnosis of autism later in life have experienced a relief in a label being given and their behavior being understood. Although I, we could also wonder why autism is in the psychiatric manual at all. I see it as simply being different. However, our therapeutic interventions can only be useful when we move away from a reductive labeling, medicalizing and see the whole person as enabled by Ardra's holistic understanding. And this needs also to include an understanding of the surrounding culture. Now, you'll, Stephen Fry, an actor well known in the UK, describes this eloquently following his experience of being diagnosed with cyclothymia and bipolar disorder. And he stated hmm, that labeling reveals more about the state of society than the state of the human mind. Now, I'm just inviting you again, just individually for a little, a little reflection. Um, bring back to mind maybe the client or the personal situation you've thought of at the start of the session and the diagnostic label. How far might this reflect the state of society rather than the human mind? It may or may not feel relevant in your situation, but just have a, a bit of a reflection on that um, uh, at this point, if that's okay. I'll just give half a minute for, for give you a little bit of space and if you have any reflections or thoughts. And of course, I'm hoping also challenges to maybe what I'm saying because that's the, the joy of debate. Okay. Okay, let's just move on now and um, think about um, some, some of these social cultural biases and judgments. Now, homosexuality is a mental disease here we have. And labeling people with a disorder is invariably offering a value judgment based on social cultural standards. And I'm carrying on with Stephen Fry, who I've just quoted, who is gay and has done much to challenge prejudice around homosexuality. And as an example of social and cultural biases and judgments, let's look at homosexuality in terms of how it's been labeled and classified in the DSM and ICD and legally over the years. Now, in DSM-2 in 1968, they promoted homosexuality. It was originally deemed a sin. They promoted it, in inverted commas, to a mental disorder, a sexual deviation. Now, in the UK, homosexuality between men was illegal until 1967. In the USA, um, it wasn't until 1973 that it became politically unacceptable to continue describing homosexuality as a mental disorder. And this happened after the American um, Psychiatric Association asked all members attending its convention to vote on whether they believed homosexuality to be a mental disorder. Now, two thirds of the psychiatrists, we're talking about over 5,000, voted to remove homosexuality from the DSM the third, about two and a half thousand, to retain it. So the APA kind of compromised and removed homosexuality from the DSM, but replaced it in effect with the label sexual orientation disturbance. And this was seen for people who are seen as in conflict with their sexual orientation. And actually it wasn't until 1987 that homosexuality was omitted from the DSM. Now, the 
So I think the evolution of the status of homosexuality and the classifications of mental disorders highlights um, that the concepts of mental disorder can be a rapidly evolving social construct that changes as society changes. Now, many of you will know that Adler wasn't exempt from making such judgments. I mean, in 1917, he'd classified homosexuals as, as falling among what he called the failures of life. And Adler's theory of homosexuality was understandably deeply entrenched in the dominant culture of the time. However, in the mid 1930s, his opinion towards homosexuality began to shift. And I think this reveals his openness to change and to develop, to know that things can be different. Elizabeth McDowell, who is a family social worker, recalls undertaking supervision with Adler about a young man who was deemed then living in sin with an older man. And Adler asked her, oh, is he happy, would you say? Oh, yes, Elizabeth replied. And Adler then stated, well, why don't we leave him alone? This was um, in Manister quotes this situation. So just see where we're at here in terms of this whole issue around culture. Ethan Waters, in his book, Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the Western Mind, also makes the point that psychiatric categories are cultural categories and particularly responsive to social change. An example is that PTSD is a diagnosis that fits a modern Western world in which people see themselves as autonomous individuals first and members of social networks second. But in other cultures, um, some other cultures, the diagnosis just doesn't make sense. Uh, as an example, he cites what happened following the catastrophic tsunami that hit the coasts of Sri Lanka, Indonesia, India, and Thailand in 2004. Many of you will recall this. And it drowned more than a quarter of a million people in one of the worst natural disasters in, in our ministry. Now, following this, many very well-intentioned trauma counselors poured into the region to help from all over the developed Western world. Now, there's no denying that the people affected by the tsunami suffered psychological trauma. The question is whether they suffered PTSD as defined by DSM-ICD. It's a question made more difficult to answer when those who failed to exhibit many of the DSM criteria for PTSD were often labeled as in denial. And one trauma counselor working in a small village worried that the children were more interested in returning to school than discussing their experience of the tsunami and were clearly in denial. Now, Guy Fernando, a professor of psychology at California State University and a native of Sri Lanka, was in the country at the time of the tsunami and one of the few to argue at that time that Sri Lankans' experience of trauma differed from Western experience. So when Sri Lankans were able to speak freely with those who spoke their own language, interestingly, the distinctive features of PTSD, such as anxiety and numbing, were generally absent. So rather than focus on their internal states, Sri Lankans tended to see the damage done by the tsunami in terms of its harm in, to social relationships. Those who suffered most were those who'd become isolated from their social network or were unable to fulfill their role in kinship groups. And in some cases, because the group itself had been destroyed. So one way to interpret this difference is that the Sri Lankans saw the damage done by the tsunami as not located in their minds, but in their social relationships. I certainly would also see a lack of social connection as a crucial universal aspect of complex trauma. Once again, Adler's understanding of our embeddedness being so clear. Although there are some developments in terms of a more holistic approach, Western medicine continues to be largely based on the idea that mind and body can be studied separately. And an assumption of being superior in contrast to cultures from African, Asian, and Native American worldviews. I think a single most damaging effect of psychiatric diagnosis is a loss of meaning. By divesting people's experience of their personal, 
social and cultural significance, diagnosis turns people with problems into patients with illnesses. Let's look now more at, at more detail of Adlerian perspective of psychopathology and diagnosis. Now Adlerians, Len and John Sperry, and then very many rich contributions in the field of psychopathology and case conceptualization write clearly about Adler's unitary view of mental distress and its treatment, identifying the Adlerian approach as follows. It's a growth rather than a medical model. And as we looked at before, rather than focus on psychopathological symptoms, we need to understand that the person is discouraged, not sick or diseased. And in the same way, as it is a psychology of use, not possession, it doesn't focus on classification of symptoms. Instead, it focuses on meanings and the purpose and the use of dysfunctional thinking, behavior and symptoms, and also crucially, it identifies the person's resources. And Lennon and John go on to identify how it integrates a psychodynamic, cognitive, and systemic focus. And I'll be coming back to Lennon and John's um, work shortly, but we also need to remind ourselves that whether it is um, the, the psychiatrist or a patient's perception, it's one person's subjectivity against another. We'll be looking at that shortly. Now, whilst, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I've jumped, I've just lost my paper there. Let's just look. Whilst Adler's wisdom has not been taken on board within the mainstream of much Western psychiatric thinking, challenges to diagnostic approaches are recently being made that do have some remarkable parallels to Adler's original ideas. And I referred, um, I referred uh, earlier to the work of a team of clinical psychologists and service users, note clinical psychologists and service users, they work together to create this. And this was sponsored by the British Psychological Society. And um, this group created what they call the Power Threat Meaning Framework. This is of psychologists Lucy Johnston and Mary Boyle. And I was pleased to say that Mary Boyle, when I just um, uh, spoke with her um, on a webinar one time and brought in Ardler, she said, yes, I do know of Ardler. So I'm hoping we're gonna get some more communication with her shortly. But their model offers a way of conceptualizing mental distress that avoids psychiatric diagnosis and categorization altogether. And as they say, it moves beyond the DSM mindset. And here's how they describe it. I think you'll note the familiarities here. A framework for understanding people in their social and relationship context, which sees them actively making choices and creating meaning in their lives within inevitable bodily, material, and social and ideological constraints. Now, I'm thinking here, if we maybe, if it, we maybe could just um, have a, a brief moment now to reflect on an example and possibly have um, uh, you know, just, a, a, I think, a, a seven minute breakout room. Um, would that be OK, um, Sabina, in groups of maybe six, seven or so on? And I think you are kindly going to put up the exercise, which is an example um, that in the chat, which you can find. And I'll just read it out here. And this is just an example. Um, Sheena's, um, Sheena's father um, left when she was three and she was sexually abused by her stepfather um, between seven and 14. And she was isolated and unhappy at school and began self-harming at 11. And she has a daughter, age seven, and left her husband due to his violence. And when her daughter reached her seventh birthday, her self-harming worsened, and she swings between being very angry and very withdrawn and depressed. And this example adapted from Lucy Johnston, um, the psychiatrist sends a referral and says, just imagine this, is sending a referral to you and says, Sheena has borderline personality disorder, non-suicidal injury disorder and intermittent explosive disorder. 
and she's taking fluoxetine at 60 mil daily. So let's just, um, so, and as I said, I'm very happy to be challenged um, about, about, I know I'm putting forward my own bias, my own um, uh, perceptions here, very much so. But let's, um, let's look a little bit more at this, um, at this uh, power threat meaning framework before then we, we move on to more Adlerian approach. And, um, oh, wait, it's not doing its thing. We'll just move it on, there we go. So what they look at with, um, in the power threat meaning is a set of, they replace the diagnostic question of what's wrong with you with such explorations what has happened to you? How's power operating your life? How does it affect you? What threats does this pose to you? What sense do you make of it? And this is what meaning do you make of the experience? So that feels very Adlerian to me. And what are you doing? Here again, the action. What are you doing to survive? What kind of threat responses, if you like, are you using? And very crucially, that's essential bit. What are your strengths? What access to power resources do you have? And what will now support you to become a cooperative, responsible, contributing member of community? And I find these questions have strong echoes with the Adlerian biopsychosocial approach that explores goal-directed movement and meaning, along with a focus on strengths and resources. And whilst also looking at the whole story of distress linked with wider social factors, poverty, prejudice, racial, sexual and cultural discrimination and inequality, along with, of course, traumas such as abuse and violence. And here also very crucially, you'll notice a move away from fixed adjectival labels and use of verbs, which enable an understanding of the person's movement and how they're perceiving and using their experience. I think something that's central to Nadlerian approach. And also, um, just still within the, their model, um, as an alternative to diagnosis, Lucy Johnson advocates working with a client to co-create a personal narrative that helps identify their view of their self and their world. And I find this has echoes, you certainly when I'm working with lifestyle assessment, it's very much a co-created collaborative process. And, uh, and this kind of uh, psychological formulation is made up of both the psychologists, clinical and research knowledge, and also very crucially, the service users expertise in their own life. And they describe it as a process of ongoing collaborative sense making. Now, Let's just now look, continue with this um, exploration to constructive alternatives. I promised you earlier that I'd be returning to the work of Len and John Sperry. And I imagine, imagine many of you have had already had the privilege to learn from them regarding their very accessible and immediately practical approach to psychopathology and case conceptualization. And for many countries, a psychiatric diagnosis such as that from DSM and ICD is needed, as I said earlier, to enable insurance cover um, for treatment. And I think their model for conceptualizing the client's issue offers a highly effective, rigorous and accessible way of integrating what they have described, integrating diagnostic, clinical, cultural and treatment formulations providing a truly holistic approach. And their, their approach, they've created their, their case conceptualization model to actually fit not only the Adlerian approach, but can be used by, by more or less all, I would, I, I think, all uh, psychotherapeutic approaches. So here again, just keeping in mind the power threat meaning framework, we can think they've got their diagnostic formulation, what happened, the clinical formulation, explanation of the client's lifestyle convictions and presenting issues. You know, why did this happen? The cultural formulation, something they've really threaded right through their work, through every aspect, looking at the cultural issues, so important, the social and cultural factors. What role does culture play? And then the treatment formulation, so the, the intervention planning, how can it be changed? And the... Um, 
Len and John define their approach to case conceptualization as a method and clinical strategy for obtaining and organizing information about a client and understanding and explaining the client's situation and maladaptive patterns and guiding and focusing treatment, anticipating challenges and roadblocks and preparing for successful termination. And in this brief overview, I'm only going to give you a tiny glimpse of Len and John's important work and using their well-conceived diagram to illustrate how it's many moving parts. You'll see it's kind of not a linear thing. It's a wonderful moving sort of holistic approach um, uh, to the person and their unique needs and future treatment. And they've done a lovely alliterative thing where their use of a series of key points, all beginning with P, with the cultural aspect identified with all of these, and it makes it all the more accessible and memorable. We've got their presentation, the predisposition, the precipitance, the protective factors and strength, which is absolutely crucial, the pattern, the perpetuance, the plan, and the prognosis. So I was just um, saying about Len and, um, and John Sperry's very good model and in you know inviting you to explore that if you're not already familiar because I think it gives uh, a wonderful holistic uh, approach and they use these wonderful P's um, to kind of help make it all the more memorable in terms of aspects that need to be addressed and maybe you can think back to your discussion that you had in the breakout rooms that I appreciate was very short but just thinking about maybe some of these P's really meet um, the, the need that we, we needed the bigger picture here. Um, I am going to just add one more um, uh, one more P though and um, I think there's an extra P to be put in here um, that, that John and Len have actually inferred. And you may recall in their definition of case conceptualization that they also include a very crucial aspect of anticipating obstacles and challenges. And they state one test and an effective case conceptualization is its viability in predicting the most likely obstacles and challenges throughout stages of therapy, particularly those involving active engagement in and commitments to the tr treatment process and resistance, ambivalence, alliance ruptures, transference, enactments, relapse and termination. And as a supervisor and a supervisor trainer, I'm passionate about a supervisor approach, a supervision approach that rigorously addresses the dynamics between the therapist and client and the supervisor and the therapist, which are inferred in Len and John's definition. But for a bit of alliterative fun, I'd like to add some extra P's to the mix here. So we've got psychiatrist, we've got psychologist, we've got psychotherapist, and we have practitioner. And maybe what we need to add is simply people. So we need to remind ourselves that whether it is the practitioner's or the client's perception, it becomes one person's subjectivity against another. Or, as Adler states, each person relates him or herself always according to his or her own interpretation of himself or herself and of his or her present problem. So maybe we have to admit that any diagnosis and conceptualization of mental distress will always have our unique interpretation. Objective. However, as long as we can maintain an open and constructive relationship with our clients and ourselves, and ultimately put people before protocols, then a co-created understanding and a route for effective therapy can usefully be found. And Charles man ahead of his time is very evident when we remind ourselves, it was over 85 years ago that he stated, a human being cannot be typified or classified. And I find it gratifying that what Adler made so clear is stronger voice within mental health systems in the West. And let's just finish with this nice thing from Karen Treisman. Uh, 
see a person differently, see a different person. See a behavior differently, see a different behavior. And here's Adler's wisdom. Everything can always be different. Alles kann immer anders sein. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. I have also here the references and, um, and uh, Sabina is going to put a PDF of um, my slides should anybody wish to have them. She's putting it onto the chat now. And so those, those um, references are there if anybody's interested, but I'm hoping we can move on to debate and discussion um, around this topic now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.